Okay, um, I think we can start. So hello everyone and thank you for participating. My name is Margarita Melovsky from the Geshen Association. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our lecturer today, Dr. Mori Soya, who is a senior researcher at the Institute of Development Economies, IDE, JASTRO, and a part-time lecturer of Social Linguistics of Japanese Sign Language, JSL, and Linguistics of JSL at Waseda University. Dr. Mari will be giving us an interesting overview of the Japanese deaf community and of sign language recognition in Japan. And I'm very happy to say that this is our first lecture in sign language, specifically American Sign Language. And I would like to thank the interpreters from Overseas Interpreting for being with us today. And before starting, I would like to remind everyone that there will be time for questions at the end of the lecture. Uh, please write them down, or you can also speak them uh, by uh, You can also say them by activating your microphone, as you prefer. Uh, and kindly turn off your cameras and microphones during the lecture, so that we can ensure stable internet connection for everyone. Okay, I think we're all set. So please, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. In Japan right now, it is in the afternoon. It's about five o'clock here. So I should be saying good afternoon. <laughs> it's quite a time difference between um, here and there, but I'm very happy to have been invited to give a presentation today to your organization. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Soya. Mori, and this is my sign name. I was born and brought up in Japan. I was born deaf as well. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the deaf community and sign language recognition in Japan. So I'm gonna go over the, the situation here. So in the content of my lecture, um, I've divided it into seven sections. So I'll talk to you a little bit about who I am. I'll give you a little history on Japan itself. And then I'll go into the history of the Japanese deaf community. We'll talk about hot topics uh, in the Japanese deaf community. I'll go into Japanese sign language, JSL. Then I'll talk about the public recognition of Japanese sign language and what's happening there. And then I will offer a conclusion. So let me start with the self-introduction and just tell you about who I am. As I said earlier, I was born and raised in Japan, specifically in Tokyo. I got my uh, bachelor's and master's from Waseda University and my PhD from the University of Rochester um, in New York, which is in the States. I work for the, the Institute of Development, Economics, and Sign Linguistics at Yokohama National University. And I give lectures at universities all over, so I get invited to speak quite a bit. There is an international agency sorry, the, Jap the Japanese Association for Asian Studies, uh, the, the Japan Society for International Development, the Japanese Economic Association, the Japan Association of Sign Language Studies, and the Linguistic Society of Japan. I'm involved with all of those organizations. But there's also a committee for disability and development um, in Japan, uh, an international cooperation agency, and I participate with that as well. Um, I've also participated in many books and even won uh, some recognition and prizes for my contributions. We've also done some translations from uh, American and European texts into uh, Japanese, Japanese Sign Language. And here are some other publications that I've contributed to. Um, 
a really important work that I did was adding and contributing to the Japanese Sign Language Dictionary, the sixth version. So now let me talk to you a little bit about uh, demographics of Japan. You, I'm gonna assume that you don't know anything about Japan. <laughs> So the general population is listed on this slide, so 377,000, sorry, square miles. <laughs> um, and in the red is, um, so you can get an idea of it, is the Italian information. Um, so you can see that the, the size is not too dissimilar between Japan and Italy in terms of the, the kilometers or square miles. In Japan, we have five main islands. Um, and they're shown on the map. We have a lot of volcanoes, <laughs> forests, agriculture, residential areas. Our population is 125 million people which is not too dissimilar to the Japanese population. Sorry, no, it's twice as much as the Japanese population. And you know the GDP, what that means, right? The gross domestic product. <laughs> which basically says how wealthy or not wealthy a country is. So you can see here in Japan, it's about uh, five and a half trillion. And in Italy, your GDP is 2.6 trillion. Um, and the reason why our GDP is higher than Italy's is because we have a bigger population. But the average earnings um, are 44,000 American dollars versus your 43. So actually, the GDP per capita isn't dissimilar. And the GINI refers to the discrepancy between those who are the richest and those who are the poorest. And our numbers are quite similar between Japan and Italy for comparison. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of some of the basic differences between our, my country and yours. So now let's talk about the deaf community in Japan. Now, it's hard to say how many deaf people are in Japan. It's a hard question to answer. And the reason for that is how do you identify deaf people? Who are the deaf people here? Now, one way to identify a deaf population is from the medical angle. Because deaf some deaf people have gone in to have hearing tests, right? And that's one way to identify if somebody's deaf or not. And here in Japan, the government also defines somebody who's deaf is that they have uh, a hearing loss of over 70 decibels for both ears, or if it's just one ear that has a hearing loss that it has to be over 90 decibels. And then they give you an ID to state that you're, that you're officially considered deaf by, by medical standards. So if 3,483 people um, are total people with disabilities, but specifically the deaf community numbers are quite small. So 276. And 
you see the numbers here for those who are under the age of 18, so not yet adults. Um, it says 93,100 people. And then how many of them are deaf? Only 15,800. So that's how many students um, are considered deaf and hard of hearing. Now, if we compare that to the Italian numbers, it looks like 70,000 people in Italy are profoundly deaf. Um, which is, I found in one, uh, one publication. So I, I, because I only found it in one publication, I'm not sure how accurate it is, but that, that is what I have found so far. Okay, and then another complicating issue is you have a group of people who don't hear, right? And then you have a group of people who use sign language to communicate. And the perspectives are very different amongst these two different communities. So you have a pathological perspective and they give, have given you their numbers, but it doesn't consider necessarily those who use sign language to communicate. So there was a researcher who at one time tried to do a calculation and to estimate how many people in Japan actually use Japanese sign language, JSL. And they came up with uh, 57,000 people uh, in Japan using JSL. But we don't know the true number. We don't know the actual number. This is uh, as close as we can estimate. Now in Australia, their government has been able to collect data about sign language users. So they have a much more accurate count, but many countries, most countries I would say, don't have an accurate number for how many sign language users are living in those countries. So to talk about the schools, currently we have 104 deaf schools. Um, and then, but for schools for children with disabilities, we have a, just over a thousand schools throughout Japan. But those that focus primarily and singularly on the deaf population, we have 104. And that number is decreasing. And you can see the two graphs on this slide, which show the age of deaf people that are alive at the moment. And the other graph talk about, talks about how many children are attending deaf schools or schools for children with disabilities. And you can see that number is decreasing. Now we'll talk about the history of the Japanese deaf community. Edo era means the last era of feudalism. And at that time, deaf people were kept at private schools and we call these private schools terakoya. And I want to show you what these schools looked like. Let me find a picture. I'll blow up the picture so you can see it. So all the all the children would come together and they'd be caught under one roof. And so they had these deaf private deaf schools. So the assumption is if you have a lot of deaf people in one place, then you must also have a sign language. But during the samurai period, um, we then had Americans coming to Japan 
Um, so before that time, our borders were really close to the world, but we then opened our borders, which allowed Americans to come. And from then on, Japan experienced a lot of changes. We then went from private schools to public schools. That's when we started seeing pub public government run schools in Japan. That was in 1872. And then in 1879, we started to see deaf schools established for deaf children. And you have uh, deaf schools throughout Japan in various areas of Japan for deaf kids. Now, just before World War II started, so I'm thinking about 1923, there was an ordinance that went out saying that deaf children needed to go to schools where they were taught in an oral method and not use sign language to communicate. So at this time, there were these deaf schools. But the deaf children didn't have to go to those schools. So if they wanted to, they could. But some of these children and their families decided that they would stay closer to home. Now, after World War II, there was a new law. And this law said that all deaf children had to go to these deaf schools that had been established. The Japanese government also had a policy. And this policy stated that all these children going to the school meant that all of these children also needed to know Japan, uh, Japanese, spoken, written Japanese. But not at all uh, Japanese sign language, right? So this meant these children were learning how to read and write in Japanese and also speak Japanese. And if you didn't know how to do these, then you were stripped of your national identity. And this is what our government came up with. And I would say that some of that sentiment is still around today. So there's a bit more history here. There is a national association for the deaf here in Japan, and they're called the JFD, the uh, Japanese Federation of the Deaf, and they were established in 1947. And the JFD um, joined up with the World Federation of the Deaf in 1959, so they became an ordinary member. And then the JFD published their first sign language uh, guidebook in 1969. And the philosophy of education based in the United States called total communication then made its arrival um, and appearance in Japan. And if you don't know, total communication is uh, the, does incorporate the use of sign language, but also voice. So signing and speaking at the same time. So this was the new, sort of the new way of, of communicating in, uh, amongst deaf people. And that really became uh, ubiquitous at deaf schools. And I would say that about half the students liked it. And for the other half of the students, it wasn't a successful communication a strategy. There were, you know, the hands were moving, there was signing, but it required the use of voicing as well. So you would have to speak in Japanese and sign in Japanese sign language. And it was very difficult to understand. But the JFD 
sort of kept the uh, kept the path because they desired to be considered equal to non-deaf people in society. And they thought that this was the way to achieve that. And then in the 1990s, we saw um, the first Congress um, in the Asian region. We saw uh, Japanese deaf theater using Japanese sign language for the first time. Sorry, and then in 1991, we had the first WFD World Congress um, in, in an Asian country. And at this time, it is really when Japan started having more international cooperation, so helping other deaf people that were living in other Asian countries. We really started um, doing what we could And then in our local governments, we, we had services finally for deaf people. And one of these services was to provide sign language interpretation. And then in 2008, deaf people in Japan were finally able to achieve their driver's licenses. So they were able to drive finally. And in that same year, in Tokyo, they established the very first uh, bilingual bi uh, program for deaf children. So it was the first bi-bi school, so bilingual and bicultural school for the deaf. So the sort of buzz topics, the, the hot topics, hot issues, are being discussed amongst the deaf community um, in Japan are these. There was a uh, international film festival in Tokyo. And this takes place every three years. We also have a deaf music uh, and poetry event where deaf people on their own are able to uh, create poems and present their poems. Um, and in a little bit, I will show you what that looks like. I'll show you some examples of that. We also have more and more children of deaf adults who are representing us as well. And various Japanese deaf people showing up in different media, social media uh, resources. Um, and in case you don't know, CODA stands for Children of Deaf Adults. So you have two adults who are deaf and they give birth to children who are, are, are not deaf. And these children grow up within the deaf community because of their parents. And finally, you have the youth of deaf. Um, showing up in media, talking about deaf life here, um, even doing radio interviews. <laughs> um, but instead of speaking, they sign and then have an interpreter doing the voiceover work and that's what gets shown and shared on the radio. And this is an opportunity for the larger communi uh, community to learn about deaf people. And I just wanna give you uh, a, a demo of what one of these, these things look like.
So this is a new film that shows how deaf people can produce music and poetry of all different kinds. So these are all different approaches to this art from deaf people. So let's carry on. So now we'll come to speaking about Japanese sign language and what it is. And you can see how the finger spelling in Japanese sign language is very different than the sign languages of Europe and North America because they follow the Japanese written system, which is called Mora, the Mora system of writing. I don't know if you're familiar with Japanese writing, but it you can see how it relates to the uh, manual alphabet. So you, I'll enlarge this photo a bit so you can see. But in general, Japanese sign language is completely distinct from Japanese spoken language. But the basic word order uh, is quite close to SOV, so subject, object, verb. So having the verb at the end, so that's the, um, the structure of Japanese sign language. And the facial expressions are, are the non-manual um, aspect of Japanese sign language. It's very complex. There are some signs that are borrowed from Chinese written systems. Um, for example, you could see here, like the sign for rice, a rice farm. So this is the sign for that because this on the hands, it looks similar to how rice is written in the Chinese um, written system. So that's how that was borrowed. And then this sign, you could see the hand shape with these three fingers held up, is, all, is a sign for river, which is also borrowed from what it looks like in the written system. But Japanese sign language in the East and the West are slightly different. Um, you know, different dialects. And there's variation geographically there. And you can see that at the deaf schools that they are using these variations of Japanese sign language. But now due to, um, you know, TV and news, having more representation of Japanese sign language you see every morning and evening. Um, so two times a day, there is news in Japanese sign language that is distributed all over Japan. So you see that influence is uh, causing Japanese sign language to become more standardized. So now you can see it a bit larger. Here is our Japanese sign language manual alphabet. And plus the Japanese sign language sign you can see over here. So it's written out, but you can see that this is how you sign, I saw a movie. So I'll play that for you. And I'll play it one more time so you can catch it. So hopefully you could all see that well, this is how you sign, I saw a movie. So this first sign that is being done is movie or film. And then the second time it's being done is I saw. The Japanese sign language has become widely accepted by Japanese society. And in many places in Japan, the local governments have programs for educating people um, and teaching Japanese sign language. And as I said before, there's some local variants in Japanese sign language. And the government's programs for teaching sign language match those local variants. So there's no discrepancies there. It's all um, you know, abiding by what's happening in that local area. The basic law for people with disabilities in Japan does exist. 
um, but it does, and it includes the term Japanese Sign Language. However, the language, there's no uh, acts related to Japanese Sign Language in the law in Japan. So despite it not being fully accepted in the government structure in society, it is widely accepted. So the Japanese Federation of the Deaf really wants to create a new law related specifically to the acceptance and recognition of Japanese Sign Language. But it is not an easy issue. And the difficulty comes from, you know, the use of, you know, this term sign language and what that really means or how to define what sign language means. There are people in Japan who do use Japanese sign language fluently, but there are also people who become deaf later in their lives and they're you know, later learners of sign language. They might use more basic sign language. And this more basic sign language would mean that they're using a lot of lip reading and they're following the Japanese spoken language with some support from sign language in addition to their speech. They're not following the proper Japanese sign language grammar and structure as other deaf community members would. But for both of these very distinct ways of using sign language, we use this general term sign language. So the Japanese Federation of the Deaf is saying that both are okay. It doesn't matter as long as they're using sign language. That's their perspective, despite the different grammars and the different approaches to using it. As long as your hands are moving and you have a visual aspect there, the Japanese Federation of the Deaf is very uh, accepting and advocating that. So as long as they're using your hands, we can, you know, we can call it Japanese sign language. But not everyone feels that way. There are some people within the Japanese deaf community who disagree. So this, the culturally deaf community believes more strongly in using the proper Japanese sign language grammar and structure. So there's this debate that's continuing on. In terms of the Japanese government, especially during the coronavirus or COVID-19 and the pandemic, of course, there is ongoing announcements about, um, you know, the government restrictions, et cetera, and all of the information. And all of these announcements were happening in spoken Japanese on the news. Finally, they brought in a Japanese sign language interpreter to interpret these announcements into sign language. And now we have this Japanese sign language interpreter service being provided. And that's with the national and local government announcements all being made accessible that way. The most recent issue is of course the Olympics in Japan and the Paralympics as well. And at the time of those two events being hosted, interpreting services were provided for the opening and closing ceremonies. And you can see these pictures here. The one to the top left is the daily television news in sign language by a deaf anchor. So it's important to note that the person signing was born and raised, they are deaf, providing the news in Japanese sign language. It's not proper for a hearing person to interpret the news. It's much more beneficial to have it be done by a deaf anchor. And then the picture beside, you can see that the prime minister is giving um, their remarks and it's being interpreted by a hearing Japanese sign language interpreter. And then you can see this film that I'll play of the Olympics. That's what that interpretation service looked like for the opening ceremonies. <laughs> 
you can see that is a deaf interpreter for the Olympics. So these are these three different approaches to providing accessibility. So now we get to our conclusion. So deaf people in Japan are a language minority, a linguistic minority. But now more and more deaf and hard of hearing children are becoming mainstreamed in education. The time of deaf children going to deaf schools is decreasing. So my second concluding point is that deaf education in Japan has a long history. Meaning that Japanese sign language has developed over this time. Over more than 150 years of development of Japanese sign language. My third point is that deaf and hard of hearing young people in Japan are ex very active in cultural activities, uh, such as film festivals. And my fourth point is that CODA, so children of deaf adults, as I mentioned before, and SODAs, so siblings or brothers and sisters of deaf adults, are also very active. My fifth point, is that research about Japanese sign language is becoming published more and more. But unfortunately, most of this research um, is written only in Japanese. So if you know Japanese and you read and write it, then you could enjoy the data that's produced in this research. But if you don't know Japanese, then this research is not accessible to you. So that's unfortunate. And then my final concluding point is that Japanese sign language has become widely acceptable or accepted by Japanese society. And more and more people are learning what ja Japanese sign language is and seeing that the deaf community is using it. So for myself, for my work and working as a deaf person here in Japan, in my office, we have total access to all of the information through Japanese sign language interpreters. Also, while I'm teaching at the university, I work with uh, an interpreter because I I'm signing in Japanese sign language as I'm teaching. So there are two interpreters there with me for to make my lecture accessible to the students. So for example, as we're doing today for my presentation. And finally, we'll see this video for thank you in Japanese sign language. So this is how you sign thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you so much for coming. And if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Okay, thank you very much, Professor, for this very interesting presentation. And I would now like to open the floor for questions. So uh, I would like to remind everyone, if you have any questions, please write them in the chat box or please activate your microphone. And we still have 15 minutes, I believe. While we wait, if there is anyone who has a question in the chat box, I would have a question, if you don't mind. Uh, I would like to ask about, oh, sorry. I've just seen that there is one question, so I will give priority to that. Professor Calvetti, hello, welcome. Hello. 
Good morning. Um, I think that I have to speak in English because uh, I could also speak uh, Japanese, but I unfortunately it's not a Japanese sign language. And uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Mori, for your very interesting uh, presentation. I have just a, two, a couple of uh, short questions. One was about the Terakoya during the Edo period. I, I didn't get if during the uh, Terakoya uh, education system, there were or not uh, deaf children's class dedicated or to um, deaf people or they studied in the, um, let's say, regular class. And this is the, uh, the first uh, question. And the second one, I'm, I'm a linguist, I, I teach Japanese linguistics, so I'm very interested in the structure of the Japanese langu um, sign language. Um, the, the, the language is based on Japanese written uh, structure or uh, has, uh, let's say, a more uh, fluid, a more um, a free uh, structure. Um, of course, I think that something that light postposition, I mean particles, joshi in, in, Japan, in Japanese, are not <clears throat> uh, signed. Uh, so uh, the, the question is, uh, how near or far is the uh, Japanese sign language to the, uh, uh, I mean, I, I mean the, the voice <laughs> uh, uh, Japanese language? And the, a, a bit of information, I've been acting as director of the Italian Cultural Institutes until uh, this uh, uh, July. And in 2019, we uh, presented um, a movie uh, called Sign Gene by an Italian uh, director, Emilio Insolera, who is uh, uh, deaf him himself. And yes, I'm very familiar with it. Okay, okay. It was very, uh, a very interesting experiment because, as you know, it was, uh, let's, so, let's say, spoken in three different sign languages, Italian, uh, Japanese, and, uh, and um, let's say, American uh, sign language. It was very funny for us who are not deaf, and we, we needed subtitles in, in order to understand the, the movie. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for your questions. Let me uh, try and answer them. So your first... <laughs> Sorry, my screen's changed, I can see. So my first response is about your question about the Terioka. back in the Edo era. So that when they have these private small schools throughout Japan. So your question about them, um, so for me to answer, was whether or not they were completely deaf classrooms or if they were mainstream. So you were asking me about that. And the answer is both. They had both types. There were quite a few that were with only deaf children. So the school was just deaf children, um, but many of them were mixed. They had deaf children plus other children that were not deaf and they existed and learned uh, in that and shared that space. But that, that's what the, what the research has shown about that history. And then to answer your second question, And just to make sure I understand it, you were asking if Japanese sign language follows uh, Japanese written spoken language. I would say that some words in Japanese sign language have actually been borrowed from the Chinese written orthography. Kanji. However, not all of the signs are the same. 
So just a select amount, just a few. As for the basic word order, in spoken Japanese and sign language are similar in that they're both SOVs. However, <laughs> uh, let me give you an example. If you want to ask a yes, no question, the way that you would do that following the Japanese grammar system is at the end of the sentence, you would have a marker, ka. But in Japanese sign language, you never use that. The question is placed in your eyebrows as one of the non-manual grammatical markers. So you don't need uh, a lexical item or, or morphine for the idea of asking a question. Another example also to do with questions, but with WH questions, which, what, why, when. So these uh, look different and function differently than the yes, no questions do. So the way to do this, In spoken and written Japanese, the way that this looks is you, the question, the word that symbolizes the question is initial, sentence initial, but in Japanese sign language, it's final, right? So it's, it's sententially final. So that's where you see the question marker. Now you can sometimes put it initially, but then you would that would only be an addition to the marker at the end of the sentence, which is obligatory. So that's, that's how the systems function, examples of how they function differently. Another example is if we look at adjectives. In spoken and written Japanese, the adjectives appear before the noun. But in Japanese sign language, quite often you'll find the adjective uh, does not precede the noun. You'll see it after the noun. So there is more flexibility um, in Japanese sign language in terms of where the adjective can exist. It can either exist preceding the noun or not. It can come, af come after the noun. So in Japanese sign language, I wouldn't say it's freely flexible and fluid. There are definite rules as to when these things can happen. It's not an arbitrary, today I feel like putting it here in the sentence and you know, tomorrow I feel like putting it here. It's, it's not quite that flexible. There are rules and guidelines for when things can be moved around. So hopefully I've answered your questions uh, to your satisfaction. Thank you very much. Okay. I don't see any more questions. Oh. Alessandra in the chat box asks, where can I find uh, video lessons about basic Japanese sign language? Sure. Well, there's YouTube. Um, there's definitely examples of uh, Japanese sign language being taught via resources on YouTube. Some are free, some are a paid service. If you pay for it, you would expect a higher quality uh, instruction. Um, and if you know Japanese, um, written Japanese, you'll find that instruction much easier to understand. So there's one that's called uh, JSL, but it's written in Japanese sign language. So the way that that looks is Nihon, 
which means Japan. The next word is shua. Shua means language. So Nihon, Shua, if you're able to, when you type that in, it converts to Chinese characters. And that will allow you to search um, and you'll see a lot of resources. Japanese sign language training courses um, that are available online. So yeah, you can definitely find some resources online. Oh, and I'm just thinking another really great resource, which you do have to pay for, but it's a course uh, that goes by the name of Sign I O. Um, that's the best one that I've seen. It's also online, um, but it's it's a learning resource for Japanese sign language. Um, but it is one that you have to pay for. And all the teachers teaching in that particular program are native signers of Japanese sign language. So, um, which really makes it um, the best resource um, and how they've organized the coursework and all of that is, is exceptional. I hope that's okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we still have two minutes. If I may, I would like to ask a question uh, about deaf education, which you have mentioned previously. Um, I wanted to ask about deaf schools. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the numbers of uh, people who go to deaf school are decreasing. And I wanted to ask if you know, how this is seen in Japan. Is it seen as a, as a positive change, as a sign of integration? Or is it seen as a, as a, net, as a negative change of uh, maybe people getting more disconnected from, uh, from deaf culture? I'm asking this because uh, deaf schools are not very popular in Italy at the moment. They have been popular uh, in the past century, actually. But um, you know, there, there are not many deaf schools at the moment. And uh, yeah, it's, there, there are mixed opinions on this in Italy. So I wanted to see how, how I wanted to ask how the situation is in Japan. Well, what a great question. Well, I, I would say there's a, a few reasons. The first one is that a lot of deaf children uh, have parents who are not deaf, right? 90% of deaf children have non-deaf parents. So they're not aware of deaf culture. They're not aware of other deaf adults. Um, they're born, you know, they have deaf children. They're really terrified. How am I gonna raise this kid, right? And since the doctors are on the scene first, they you know, give the parents a lot of advice. But the medical field are also ignorant about the deaf community and deaf culture and deaf adults that have succeeded in life and these sorts of things, right? So the advice that's given to these parents is, oh, they can have a cochlear implant. And then they'll be able to speak. And the parents are like, really? There's technology for that? And, you know, the, the parents trust the medical field. And then these children go into mainstream schools and mainstream uh, educational environments. But these environments don't, aren't successful very often for these kids. And what happens is as they grow up, I would say that a lot of these children end up with no language at all, right? They end up with no, no Japanese. They can't learn Japanese. 
They haven't learned sign language. How are these people even communicating? Right. And I've met people who've gone through this experience and I just, I have a lot of sympathy for them. And deaf people know that this is happening, right? But the parents of these other deaf children, you know, they don't know what to do with having deaf kids. And because the doctors are on the scene first and the medical teams are on the scene first, they have this power of influence. And so that's what's happening. Now, in addition, we need to talk about our government here. There's an insurance policy. And within the, the insurance policy, it says that their medical issues will be covered, right? So it's not very expensive to seek things like cochlear implants. And the insurance will cover the cost of these implants. So if these implants, implants weren't free, right? These parents of these deaf children would, would surely say, yeah, no, we can't afford that. We're not going to have, we're not going to make sure our kid has a cochlear implant. The government has said, no, 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 we'll pay for it. And so the parents are like, yeah, sure. Of course, that's what we'll do then if you're going to pay for it. But the result of this are these deaf children um, with really sad stories of their life experiences. Now, the Japanese Federation of the Deaf has said has not spoken out against the cochlear implants. They have said nothing. They've remained quite silent on the issue. And because they're refusing to say anything, the assumption is that, oh, cochlear implants must be good, right? Because they're not taking a stand against it. And so that continues to happen. And society at large has a really hard time um, being inclusive of deaf people. So a lot of deaf people end up not graduating and finishing school. If they, um, they get invited instead to go into vocation, but they don't allow deaf children into, some, into certain schools. Like, can they even study? Can they read? And they just make all these assumptions and exclude them from having the same opportunities as everybody else would have. And then what happens is there's a very negative perception on these deaf schools, right? And deaf education. So the, the situation's very complicated. There's so many layers to it. So. Hopefully uh, that answered your question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor. And, oh, we have a message. No, sorry. I can't have any. Okay, unfortunately, our time is up. Sorry, uh, Hells and Gate, for taking five more minutes. Uh, thank you very much for, for your service and for being here today. And uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Dr. Mari. It was an honor to, for us to have you here and we hope you will be back soon <laughs> uh, with uh, maybe some more conferences about Japanese sign language and uh, deaf studies. Okay, so that's it. Thank you everyone for participating and uh, See you soon. <laughs> I would like to remind you that you can find the recorded version of this lecture on YouTube. We will also add a list, Italian Sign Language uh, interpretation to the video, and it will be uploaded in uh, maybe a month or so. Dr. Mori also wanted to thank everybody for being here today and for, um, for attending to the session.